We got Big Mike and Hazy Entertainment here. We got Shane Corson coming up here, NHL veteran of 19 seasons, Olympic medalist, Canada Cup winner, and World Junior winner. Let's go. Thank you very much for taking your time today for us. We appreciate it. No problem, boys. How's your day going? It's been going good. I uh, went out golfing for the first time in about six years. Lost three dozen balls. <laughs> right. That's always the way. That's how my golf game goes as well. Uh, we're not. I took my daughter and um, my son and his his buddy out, and uh, none of us are very good. So it was a fun day. Though we got to I got to spend time with the kids, so it was good. That's always a good day. We're just going to ask you a bunch of questions about uh, your career and stuff. Um, I'll shoot. What was the feeling getting drafted uh, eighth overall to the Canadians in '84? Uh, it was a pretty special day for me, boys. I. Uh, I mean, I always dreamed about playing in the NHL, and to be drafted by the Canadians in the Montreal Forum was pretty special, right? Um, I had met with them actually the night before the, the draft, and they had kind of said they were interested in taking me, but they picked fifth, actually, in the draft. And they ended up taking Peter, so I thought, oh, I'm going to go somewhere else. And then they made the trade to get St. Louis's eighth pick and ended up taking me eighth, so it was pretty special. I mean, I was a Leaf fan growing up uh, growing up in Barrie. Well, I was an hour down the road, so I was a big Sittler fan and Lanny McDonald and Ian Turnbull and Palmateer. I thought it was Palmateer when I played in net, so on the on the road hockey. But I mean, <laughs> Those are I some mean, big I, names. I, it Those was pretty special. Players. I was just excited to get drafted, though, you know? I was just excited to get drafted and get my opportunity to play in the NHL. Right on. And, uh, like, what did you say the different, biggest differences were from playing from Hamilton to the NHL? Oh, it was definitely the speed and the size and the strength of the guys. I mean, there was a lot of great players playing in, in the OHL, but uh, when you made the next step, everybody was really good, so – you had to step up your game. You had to get a little bit stronger, a little bit faster, and uh, they're just a lot more mature and understand understood the game, especially in Montreal. They taught us to play defense first, and we played all three zones. If you didn't play all three zones, you weren't going to play. So, I mean, I just think it was a level. The, the speed and the, and the strength was obviously the biggest difference for me. There are men that we uh, were kids who want to play in a men's league, right? Of course. And in Montreal, man, you guys had some stacked teams there. I mean, and having Patrick Law on net, that would have been fun every practice, every game. Oh, yeah, a lot of fun, boys. Uh, he he was so intense. If you shot the puck too high, you were going to either get a stick over the head or a puck shot at you. So oh, he, he was an incredibly much. intense uh, tense, uh, goaltender and player, and um, that's why he's one of the greatest ever. He's just a, a great player and a, an intense guy. Yeah. But, yeah, we were we were pretty lucky. We had some great players there. Larry Robinson was just a gem. He was just an unbelievable person and uh, more and a great player, but more importantly, just a good good leader for us. I mean, he was really good to us young guys. Chris Chelios was an amazing guy. Um, I mean, he took me under his wing and we spent a lot of time together and became really good friends. But that team was incredible. I remember walking into the dressing room uh, when I was first drafted. I got down to Montreal and I walked in the room at the old forum there and turned the, the corner and there was Guy Lafleur sitting in all black. And it's true. He was in all black. He loved black. He had his black car parked in the, the back of the uh, old forum and he was the only guy allowed to park inside. And, uh, he was smoking a cigarette too, so it was pretty funny. But I mean, um, times have changed a lot. But it was just just a great feeling. That that team had so much history behind it. There were, you've seen so many great players. Rocket was around. Jean Beliveau. They were just always around the rink, and I think that was special for us too, as young guys come in and see great players like that. And uh, they were just so. Yvonne Cornway was another guy. Yvonne Lambert. They were all there all the time. Steve Shutt. and they treated us young guys like gold. So it just made it the transition from from junior hockey to the NHL that much easier to be able to uh, lean on those guys and spend some time with them. I'll never forget uh, being a kid and my dad gave me these two photos and we were at a sports card show in Vancouver and uh, he goes, Hey, Mike and your brother, Eddie, go get these signs. So we're like, okay. So we're looking around the show, looking around the show while well, it's the two brothers and they're holding the cop, but this was 40 years later. So I'm looking for these two young studs holding Stanley cop while well, they were nowhere to be seen. So finally, there was an old guy that's signing autographs. So I sent my brother over there, and he goes up to him, and he goes, like, are you the Rocket? And he goes, you, you bet you, you bet you, kid. We sat there, he signed it for us, and we had a chuckle. Yeah, he, you know what? That's one thing I learned from going to Montreal. I mean, the, the, uh, the veteran players, the older players, 
the le- and they're all legends, right? But they always had time for the fans, and that's something they taught us young guys is that uh, you wouldn't be here uh, making a living at what you love doing if you didn't have these fans. So take the time to spend some time with them, sign their autographs, and and spend some time to speak with them and just uh, get to know them a little bit and let them get to know you. But uh, that's something that those guys is. Uh, they're just so classy. They always had time for people. They never walked by anybody. And that's something also Johnny Bauer from the Leafs. I did a lot of work with him with alumni. Just another incredible man. So the, the older generation were just amazing. And they taught us a lot. And uh, they're right. I remember being a young kid growing up in Barrie, Ontario, playing uh, minor hockey. They used to go to the junior B t- games all the time. They're the OHL now, but they used to be a junior B team back then. And uh, Kevin Guest was a guy on the team, and he's probably the worst player on the team. But um, I asked for sticks, and I asked everybody on the team, and he was the only guy that stopped and gave me a stick. From that day on, he was my favorite player. And I still have that stick, and I, I'll never forget him. They called him Getty, and he had it on his stick, so I'll never forget that. But yeah, as, you're, as a kid, you never forget those things. Sorry about the dog, boys. we got a big oh, dog. Oh, that's okay. So. That's okay. My <laughs> only one, <laughs> yeah. So they're out barking. He's barking. He's going crazy. Somebody's in the front yard. But. I'll never forget that guy, and that's that's something that I always tried to do is try to be, uh, you know, somebody that would take the time to spend it with the fans and then uh, talk with them and uh, just let them get to know us a bit as best people, not just hockey players. And, uh, you know, I'm a fan too, so we're all that's fans. That's one of the biggest reasons we're kind of doing this thing, to be honest, is we just kind of like want to – we want to hear stories. We want to hear this stuff. Like, a lot of guys don't have that chance to tell us, tell fans. They don't have that chance to stop and – give us 10 minutes of their time where now we're kind of lucky with this zoom calls and stuff that they can actually explain some stories to us and tell us some stories. Oh, well, that's, that's, to be honest for me, I, I love playing the game of hockey. It's something I love, but it's the memories and the friendships I created. And then since I've been done, I've been doing a lot of these charity events for heart and stroke and hockey helps the homeless across Canada. And for myself, I know it's the guys that I'm playing with. That's the part they love being in the room and hearing all the different stories, but for, for myself, and I know a lot of the guys that, that that's the most, fun part for them is to be able to tell the stories. And, and I think uh, it, it helps us too a little bit. You know, we love playing the game and we miss that part. We miss the part of being in the dress room with the players. So when we get in there and we get telling stories and have a few beers here and there, maybe more than a few, but anyways, <laughs> a lot of pops. Um, it's just, it's the, it's the fun part of it. It's, that's the time and the memories that you have. And, and we have a lot of good stories and some can be told on Zoom and some can't be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. We had, uh, we had Malarchuk on. So, he had some killer stories for us. Oh, I mean, I, well, I got, I got lots of stories, brother. I mean, uh, oh, yeah. just, I'm sure you've, I'm sure you've read the papers back in the day. I, I liked having fun on the ice and off the ice. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. one story I have, um, well, there's a couple, but there's one, there's one of my favorite stories is where we were playing in Calgary and uh, Mike Keen and I and Charlie and a bunch of the guys were out. Charlie had gone back early to the hotel. I think we were staying at the Western hotel down in Calgary there and they had a big, you know, in the hotels, they always have a big Christmas tree in the lobby, right? Yeah. So we walk into the hotel after hours, and Keener and I decide we're going to take the Christmas tree down. <laughs> so we take the Christmas tree. We've got to break it into about three different pieces to get to stuff it in the elevator. We get in the elevator, and we decide we're going to go upstairs, get into Chelly's room, because he always left his door open. when we, He said he was leaving a little bit early, leave his door open, so we'd go see him after. We'd go in there and order some food or have a few more pops. So we go in there, and he's sound asleep. We throw the Christmas tree on him. He gets up, he's steaming mad, he had fell asleep. So we all shuffle off to our rooms. There's like stuff all over the floor, from the tree, all over the hallway, right? <laughs> so my, fo- my phone rings. I pick up the phone, it's Pat Burns. Oh, no. Of course. Get your ass down here right now and bring the tree. <laughs> the tree's in pieces everywhere, right? So I'm oh, my God, what am I going to do now? So I pick a couple of pieces up, get in the elevator, jump in the elevator, head down, the door opens, and he's standing right there right at the door as the door opens and I'm going didn't say a word just hand the two pieces of treat got back in the elevator up to bed next morning Keenan and I are getting on the bus he's sitting in the front like this just shaking his head at us way to go and I can't say the words he used but he said way to go you bleeping idiots yeah. so for, yeah, for that when we got back from that trip we had a little bit of a meeting with Pat Mike and I it wasn't wasn't a great meeting he put us in our place it. a little bit. Pat was pretty tough, right? Well, ex-cop, so he, he laid into us when we got home. But, yeah, he never let us forget that one. But we got I got I a ton. Do you got any more questions? Yeah, we only have time. You, got lots you can ask whatever you want, boys. Anything. Okay, you were traded for Vincent Danfus, correct? Yeah, I was, I was traded for Vinny to, to Edmonton. Okay. You played Vinny, with Gretzky Vinny was, when you Vinny, went, Sorry. Go ahead. Did you play with Gretzky when you went to St. Louis? 
Yeah, well, I was with Gretz. Actually, I played with Gretz before that. I got, I'm, I'm actually really good friends with Gretz. Um, him and I played the 91 Canada Cup team uh, together. I played in a line with him and uh, Steve Larmer. So, to be honest with you, there were, that's the year they, they picked 66 guys to come there and try out. And there was a bunch of guys that got cut. And, like, Eisman got cut that year and a lot of great players. Every year, a lot of great players get left out. There's so many great players in Canada. But um, that year, uh, we had to show up in training camp. And actually, another story is I walked in there, and I'm, I'm looking at the lineup. So when we went in there, there was three different teams because there were 66 of us. So what we did is we pl played around Robin, and then Keenan slowly cut you down. So I go in and look at the lineup. It's Shane Corson, Wayne Gretzky, Steve Larmer. I go, I start instant sweat, right? I'm going, oh, my God, playing with Gretzky and Larmer. All. I was 25 at the time. So first practice, we go out, and I'm nervous. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you, boys. My hands were shaking. My feet were soaking wet. And I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Don't, don't mess up. Don't, don't, don't mess up. Don't, don't. So first thing, uh, first line rush, three on twos. We're doing some three on twos. Gratz passes over to Larmer. Larmer gives it back up to uh, Gratz. I'm thinking, I'm just going to go to the net. Let these two guys make the plays. I'll go to the net. Hopefully, I can bang one home. Sure enough, goes Gratz to Larmer, back to Gratz. He's looking at Larmer, and then he makes that non-look pass to me. Back door, wide open net. What do I do? Heal it. Goes into the corner. I'm thinking, oh, my God. I'm going to be off his line in like five minutes. <laughs> Gretzky, the class guy he is, he came over, had him in the back, said, don't worry about it, kid. I got you. He took care of me that whole – that whole training camp, I was with him and Janet and my mom and dad. They were up there with us because we were in Collingwood for part of the training camp. And Gretzky took care of us the whole time. Just an we amazing actually, guy. We and, and then I got to play with him again. And I got to play with him again in St. Louis with me, him, and I and Holly. We played on a line together, so that was pretty incredible. Um, Holly's a beauty too, boys. He's he's quite a character. But I got a good story for you from the Canada Cup. So. When Keenan would cut guys, all he'd do is he'd send one of the trainers in, and he, the trainer would just point to a guy, and that meant right away. When, you when they first did the first couple of guys, we didn't know what it meant, but later we knew you're going to see Mike, and you're going to get cut. So we get down to the final probably three or four cu cuts, and me and Rick Talker sit beside each other in a corner, and we're like, here comes the trainer, right? And we're thinking, oh, my God. So we start trying to, like, make ourselves as small as possible, hide behind <laughs> each other. The guy comes in, he starts pointing at guys, and we didn't get – Point. And so we knew we had made a team with our holy shit, we made the team, man. This is great. So that night we decided to go out. We go out that night just to celebrate. We don't play for three more days. After training camp, they gave us three days to go out. So obviously we're gonna go out. So everybody goes out, Gretz included all of us. We stayed out pretty late. Uh have a few, quite a few pops. Uh we had practice the next day at eleven. So we're out in the ice and guys are just terrible. There's passes behind in the skates. <laughs> You can smell us. We have the Vicks rubbed on the Vic, rub, Vicks, the Vicks rubbed on, right, to hide the smell, but it's not working. We're just awful. So it's about 20 minutes into practice. And we had Pat Burns, uh, Mike Keenan, and Daryl Sutter were our three coaches, right, three tough, hard-nosed coaches. And, uh, he, and uh, Mike's the head coach, so he blows a whistle, and we're thinking, oh, God, we're in, a lot of, we're in big trouble here. So he calls us, and he goes, you guys are awful, if you know what I'm saying, bleeping awful. And we were like, in our heads, we're going, yeah, you're right. He goes, get off the ice before you hurt yourselves. 20 minutes into practice. So we all take off. Gratz, Mass, and Koff stay there with them. So we're going off the ice. I kind of take a peek over my shoulder, look back, and I see them all laughing. Mass, Gratz, Koff, and the coaches too. I'm thinking, we just got thrown off the ice, and he seemed really pissed off. And we're getting thrown off the ice. What the hell is going on over there? So Gratz comes in the room after, and he, he sat pretty close to me, and we, we start chit-chatting. He goes, they wanted to get off the ice as bad as you, as we did. They were just as drunk as you guys. We were last night. He goes, we, we were out, they were out just as late as us and had just as much fun. I go, holy shit, perfect. Okay. <laughs> so we took <laughs> the rest of the day off and we came back the next day and worked hard and had a great practice and ended up winning the Canada Cup. It was just a lot of fun. But that's just the type of guy me. Gretz was. He just, he took care of everybody. Everybody. I told you, Rudy was here interviewing him with him last night and, uh, he says nothing but good stories to tell about Gretz too, so. Oh my God. He's just, Honest guys, he's one of the he's one of the best teammates I've had. I, I go down to his. He used to have a fantasy camp down in um, Vegas every year, which is one of my favorite. I've Instagrammed it. You've probably seen that one picture, and I'm going to be sending another one out soon. But it's one of the best events ever. You're down there with for a week with guys like you, and then he brings down a bunch of his buddies like pros, and we just have a week of we play three days of hockey. And the rest of the time, just talking, telling stories, drinking, and they, a few of the guys do a little bit of gambling if they want. And the rest of the time, we're just hanging out. Having fun. Sounds like a good time with your bros. Yeah. How do I get uh, on that? That's, that's what, it's incredible. It's incredible. 
But he, yeah. he, he stopped it two years ago, and I'm so pissed off. Oh, about, well, I look forward to it every March. It was right around his oh, birthday maybe, all the time. Maybe we'll have to start off the course in one. Well, I did a golf tournament, boys, and it was a disaster for 10. I think we did it for 12 years. We had to stop. There was too many divorces. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. So we had to stop. My son, I have a, I have a uh, 26-year-old son. He, he begs me, and then every, he begs me every year, let's start up the tournament again, Dad. Let's start up the tournament again. And then I see business guys around Toronto all the time. They say, we got to get that tournament going again, Shane. I said, it ain't happening, boys. <laughs> That's what we're trying to do with this, too. Put on a, maybe a golf tournament for all our guests at the end of the year. That, that, that's a, that, that'd that's be a, a lot big, of fun. That's a big dream. It's a big dream, but probably need some sponsors for that. Ooh. Yeah, well, that's – that's my buddy used to run mine. One of my best friends who was my goaltender growing up uh, in Barry. We've been best friends since we were six years old. He's the guy that used to run it all and set it all up, and he had a lot of connections to a lot of the players um, and a lot of connections to sponsors after, and uh, that's a big part. you got to get big sponsorship for sure. It's, uh, it's not an easy thing, and that's why he ended up – Stop doing it because it just it just got so we were a three day event at one point where you have everybody wow. have to stay for three days and uh, we're just like foos and booze on every booze on every hole it was just a, it became a shit show so <laughs> it was That's well enough. known around uh, Ontario and across actually across Canada but yeah it's it's not happening anymore guys was I grew there up a, a one was there one thing or a couple things that motivated you before every game like a song or a memory or um. You know what? I'll be honest with you. Like when I was younger, playing, growing up with my buddies, my my friends that I grew up with and played hockey with my whole life, we used to uh, listen to "We Will We Will Rock You." We are the champions before every game. Yeah. So funny thing is, we never we played all kinds of different music growing through my hockey career, like junior and NHL and all that stuff. But that always played in my head before games. Uh, it was something that I always thought of before games. My dad was a coach for coached our team for a long time, and then we had other other good coaches after that. But that song always played in my head before I went on the ice. Um, after my dad, my dad died when he was 45 years old, so I always said a little thing to him before the game. And during, I don't know, you watch guys when they're on the blue line when O'Can is being sang or the, the anthems, wherever you're playing or whatever. If you're playing in, um, obviously, international hockey, it depends on who wins. And that was usually us, Canada, so we heard Canada a lot. But yeah, anyway, definitely. Um, I would sit there and think about him and just get myself fired up. You know, I just go out and play hard. But that, that, and then we had our little rituals we always do. You know, you see different guys doing different things. Just slapping one guy. That, well, Patrick Roz one was he'd sit, sit the puck. And I remember seeing it for the first time. He'd put the puck in front of him. He'd be sitting on the bench like this. And he'd just be staring down at the puck. If he went near that puck or even stepped over, he'd go banana. Like, don't go near it. Stay away from the puck. So there was everybody. But everybody had a little thing they did for sure. They could say they don't. And there are some guys that aren't that way so they just get ready like Chelios Chelios would get ready I don't know how he did it boys he'd wait till seven minutes before the game but like for the warm-up and get dressed seven minutes I got a guy like that on my team it drives me mental and then I but and then he'd do it after the game but I realized why after the game he'd want to be out in seven minutes because you got to get to the bar or the restaurant yeah that's right really out. we're out <laughs> yeah, so he he he's another gem, boys. That 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 guy there. He's he became one of my. Well, he's still one of my best friends. Um, he obviously lives in Chicago now. He worked for the Blackhawks, but we still talk on a regular basis, and we try to see each other when we can. But he's another he was beauty. So fun to he watch. Was a beauty. What's that? He was so fun to watch. Uh, he he's a beauty too. Like he that guy was so competitive too. Like he'd chop your ankle off if you watch some of the old clips, like in front of the net. He was brutal, brutal. But um. He's a beauty on and off the ice. He's just a, an awesome dude off the ice too, and just a great, great hockey player, obviously on the ice. But we so, we had a lot of lot of fun fun times together playing in Montreal. I was sad to see him get traded. Um, he got traded for Savvy Denny Savard, but I was really pissed off at the time. But uh, to be honest, Savvy is another good person. He came in and just an un unbelievable guy. Him and his wife were great people. So we became uh, pretty good friends too over the, over the couple of years I played with him in, in uh, Montreal, but Chelly's definitely one of my best friends in hockey and one of the best players ever, most competitive players I ever played with. Definitely. You were the captain of two NHL clubs. What's it take to make be a captain? Well, I think um, for me, it was just more about being a leader by example, try to work hard every day. Uh, when you come to practice, work hard. I mean, back in our days, it was a little different. You know, we went out, we had fun and we enjoyed ourselves off the ice a little bit more than the, the current players do and it's changed because of social media and all that stuff and obviously that everything's changed because the training and all that stuff's changed but 
I mean, I tried to lead by example, play hard, and I was I tried to stick up for my teammates and, you know, I'm trying to make everybody. I think something I got taught at a, at a fairly young age was you, if you're going to win championships, you got to make every player on the team feel part of it and feel, feel important just as the other. Like, it doesn't matter if you played two shifts, one shift, or you're sitting in the stands and you're one of the block aces, you're going to come in when somebody gets hurt. you got to make everybody feel part of the team and feel important. And if you do that, I think you're going to be successful and win. And that's what I tried to do. I tried to make the young guys coming in. I know there's some guys that get mad when you guys come in because they're worried about losing their job, but you can't be that way. You, those young guys might be the difference of winning a championship if somebody gets hurt or they might play have a great season and play great in the playoffs like Patrick Waugh did in Montreal, Claude Lemieux did it in Montreal, just for some examples. So I think I, was just, I, I, think I just tried to make everybody feel good and feel a part of it. And, uh, and, and that's, for me, was the most important. And, you know, I, I enjoyed myself off the ice. It's well known. But, I, I mean, when I came to the rink, I tried to give everything I had. And then if I was, had to be there for a teammate and stick up for him, I tried to do that too. I was a big Claude Lemieux fan as a kid. Yeah, he, he was a great player, man. He – Pepe drove everybody nuts in the other team, and a lot of times he'd drive us nuts too in the room and in, in <laughs> practice. He was just – that's just Claude Lemieux, right? But he's, he's a great person. And uh, if I'm going to go to war and, and want to win a, win a championship, uh, he's a guy that I would, uh, would want on my team. He's just a great player. and He plays hard. And he's – people don't realize how big and strong that guy is. He's got – like his legs are like tree trunks. And he's just a – he's uh, – He's a winner. He knows how to win. He knows how to score the big goals. And he's going to go through a wall for uh, to win win championships. He's going to go to he's going to go to war for his teammates too. Yeah, you know, but I always still kick this off at once in a while. Like, Pepe could be Pepe, and everybody understands that's just Pepe. This let's just deal with it. But he he's a great hockey player and a good person. I always love the dirty antics. I, that's why I admired my game after him. Him and Theo Fleury were my two favorite players. Well, Theo Fleury was my roommate in the Olympics in '98. That's so where Theo my Fleury, my was. Theo, was Theo Fleury, Ray Bork, and Keith Primo. Mark, were, we were roommates at the 98 Olympics together. Fleury's, Fleury's a hell of a hockey player, man. That guy's got – he wasn't the biggest guy. And, and nowadays it's a little bit different, but back then it wasn't a little games uh, man game. And he was, he was incredible. And uh, when I got to know him at the Olympics, I, just, I got more admiration and respect for him as a player. I just see him every day in practice too and, and, and with the things he could do. But, yeah, the Olympics were a lot of fun too, and it was kind of shocking – you know, when that all happened, but. So that was my next question was, that was the year that we left Gretzky on the bench during the shootout. Yeah, I'm lost for words right now, boys. Yeah. He, uh, yeah. he was sitting right beside me on the, on the bench. Cause like I said, we got pretty close. That, that year I played, with, I played actually on the line with Eric Lindros. So it was supposed to be Korea, but Korea got hurt. So it was either Recky or Brindamore. But Gretz was sitting right beside me. And every time he called somebody, I kind of like would look, to, to, to my side to, at Gretz to see what he's thinking. And Gretz didn't make a face, but he'd give me this one. He'd knee me, er, give me a little knee and go, didn't say anything. I just knew what that meant. And he's thinking, oh, my God. And I'm thinking, I look over my shoulder at Crawford thinking, okay. I mean, they're all great players, but he's the greatest player ever. You know, yeah. you're going to lose. If you put, don't put him out and we don't lose, which happened, Crop took a – you know, Mark Crawford was our coach, who I have a lot of respect for. He took a lot of heat for that, as did the rest of the uh, management. Bob Ganey was there and Bobby Clark were our GMs. I'm curious but, if you ask him that question now, what he'd answer, because, I mean, he's by far the greatest ever. There will never be a Wayne Gretzky. I don't never. care about these players nowadays. There is no Wayne Gretzky. No, no, they'll never be. You know, and, that, and the thing is that he was so classy, he, wouldn't, he didn't say a word. He just took it. But we were all thinking, and we all talked about it after. We go, like, you, and not like I was explaining, is if you put him in there and we lose, so what? It's Wayne Gretzky. You put him in there, he's supposed to be in a shootout. But Croft didn't decide in the management. It wasn't just Croft's decision. I'm sure it was a bunch of them made a decision of who was going to go. Because what happens is there's going to be five guys going. If it wasn't decided, then they had another five picked already that were going to go. So hopefully it would have been there. But, I mean, if you don't put them in and you lose, then you take the heat like they took. So everybody was pretty shocked. I think the whole country was shocked. I, I know I was. I was like, I, I didn't know what I to think or say. And it, it was probably the, the thing that, it's one of my best experiences in the game of hockey, being in the Olympics and seeing how hard the, the amateur athletes have to work and they get paid nothing and they give up their, their time. And they have to work on top of it and to see them compete. And it, it could be over like that. They could fall, slip, whatever, and, they're, and they're, they're done. So I got that part of it. I really enjoyed that part to get to know them and, and just the respect I have for amateur athletes and the, the, the people that go and represent Canada. It's just incredible for me. But losing to the Czechs in that shootout was just – we played for the bronze game, and I don't think anybody really wanted to show up. I think everybody wanted to just go home after the game. And you look back and you wish, you wish you would have went out and competed and played hard and got a bronze medal because having a bronze medal even from the Olympics is pretty incredible, right? But 
And yeah, it, was just, it was it was pretty hard on us to, to lose that. So I think our hearts just weren't there anymore. I still remember it pretty clear, the face that, that Gretzky had while he was sitting on the bench. It reminds me a lot of when the Seattle Seahawks should have ran the ball with Marshawn Lynch, but they threw the ball instead. <laughs> no kidding. It, it's it's heartbreaking, man. It's, it's, it's such an empty feeling when something like that happens. You're so close, right? So they're yeah. like, they could run that in. They're, they're in. They win, they win the Super Bowl, right? If we, if we score the goal, and Robert Reichel, who I played with in Toronto, scores the goal on a half slap shot. They used to do in the, in our, during our season. He'd go in the shoe at sometimes. He'd never score. And we'd always tell him, Robert, put the half slap shot away. Don't use it anymore. Sure enough, he uses, <laughs> uses it back in the day. And he, he brings it up to us, too. He goes, well, I, I scored the winning goal in the Olympics. Well, it doesn't work anymore, Robert. This was in yeah. the 2000 when I played Toronto. But you're so <laughs> close to winning something, yet so far away when you see that puck go in. And then, the, and then they, we don't score on our chance. It was pretty – it was devastating. I'll tell you, I've never seen a bunch of guys so devastated because we take a lot of pride in representing our country because, listen, we're all hockey fans. We all have our teams that we love. But when you're representing your country, you have the whole country behind you. And we feel that as players playing for representing our country. We want to win for, obviously, for ourselves, but for our country and our fans. And, uh, yeah, it's just a, a weird, empty feeling when you're so close but yet so far away. Uh, every team had a guy that was like that wild one or the team pump-up guy. Do you have any of those guys in mind? What's that? So I didn't hear that. Uh, every team has like a pump-up guy or like that wild guy on their team. Do you have anyone in mind that you can remember playing with? Oh yeah, um, one of the, the best and um, guy, one of my best teammates I ever played with actually was in St. Louis. Mark Bergman, the GM of the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, he he is like it's you don't see that now because he's the GM and he's like got the tie and the glasses on and everything. But he's one of the funniest guys I've ever played with in my entire life. And he had a different way of pumping us up. He actually did it another way. He'd make us laugh and joke and have fun and just he was the he was the jokester, the prankster. And you just kept us calm and loose. And then you just go out there and play your game. You feel great, right? There's different ways of getting guys ready for, for, for games. And different teams react to different ways. And our team in St. Louis is an older, more mature team, veteran team. So he just kept us loose and goosey. And then we go out and play. And Grant Fear was over there. He was like just laying in the corner like before the game. And then he'd go out there and play <laughs> unbelievable. But, yeah, there's always a different guy on every team. I mean, Pepe was one of our guys in uh, Montreal. Like, he was always – <laughs> always chirp and always, always, always yapping, but he'd fire us up. Let's go, you guys, Steve, come on. And uh, uh, Tabernacle, let's, uh, let's go tonight and let's run through the board. He was like, he was unbelievable. He was just, fire. he was always, always, always fired up and intense. So, uh, we had, we had a lot of guys who were like, everybody leads differently, right? Everybody can get you excited, and pumped up in different ways. Like, you know, Bob Bagani didn't say much very often. When he said it, everybody just sat there, didn't say a word and listen. You take it, you soak it all in. And it just kind of fired you up thinking, that's Bob Gainey telling you this, this, and this. And then Larry was amazing. Larry was another guy. He'd just get step up sometimes if we were in between the game, in between periods and things weren't going well. He'd just jump up and he'd just give you like a speech. Like not screaming, yelling, just a speech, but tone, higher tone, ready to roll, and, and a few swear words here and there. <laughs> I don't know what I can say on these things. They just started doing them, boys. Hey, but anyway. hey you're, allowed, you're allowed to say whatever you want on ours. We don't mind. We're Perfect. having a few – we're having a drink, so every time that you say um or I say um, we have to drink one. <laughs> you should have told me that, boys. You're going to be hammered by the end of the podcast then. Um, 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 um. <laughs> we, we, we have you more if, if you had told me that, I would have had one with you. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. I'll do it again. Hey, um, okay. Uh, we'll do it again. I'll take, I'll For sure, I'll do it with you guys again. Yeah, I'll quote, I'll quote you on that. Three-time three -time NHL All-Star. What's the best part of All-Star Weekend? Again, just being with the boys and being able to play with some of the great, some of the great players in the NHL. Like, I mean, I, I just felt very lucky and very fortunate to get the chance to go to that, that game three times. And uh, to be able to be there, uh, actually one was in Vancouver, the one I played in 98, because I went to the Olympics the same year. Uh, Pittsburgh was another time I, I actually got to take my dad to the Pittsburgh one. He, had, he was still alive at that time, so that was pretty special. And then there was one in New York where um, I don't remember the whole thing, actually, to be honest, in New York. You know what I'm saying, boys? I said, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a lot that weekend. <laughs> but it, it's just being there to be able to spend and share that moment with a, a lot of great hockey players and pick their brains. And, you know, the first one, I was really young, so I got to talk to a lot of them and, and find and learn from them. I learned from them. And it was just – I was with some of my heroes and my idols when I was there, so it was great for me. 
You still have your restaurants? Uh, no, my parents had, my mom and dad had restaurants from when I was like, I think we opened mom's pantry, which is in Barry, when we, when I was like 11, 12 and I worked, I was washing dishes there. My sisters worked out front and my dad was in the kitchen and my mom worked out front. But um, when my dad passed away, my sister, my oldest sister and my mom ran it for years and years and years, but they sold that about eight, nine years ago. So then I had one in Montreal for a while. Shane's 27. That was a lot yeah. of fun, boys. A I lot of fun. There was a lot of humming going on there too, but we, uh, we got rid of that. The restaurant business why, is not a great business. Why number 27 then? What's that, buddy? Why number 27? Why 27? Yeah. By number. 27. No, 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 like, why, okay, no, but why did you have, is there a reason that you picked number 27 when you played? Oh, sorry, sorry. I thought you meant for the restaurant. Um, okay, there was a couple reasons, to be honest, why, why to pick 27. Growing up in Barry, I was a big Leaf fan, so I did like Daryl Sittler. Brian Trotche was another group player I loved. Bobby Clark was another player I loved. I liked players that played the whole game, the full full ice, and they would they would drop the gloves if they needed to too. And both Clark and and Trotcher, and even Sittler would do it once in a while. Clark and Trotcher probably a little bit more. So I liked I liked Sittler growing up. And then uh, when I left uh, junior hockey, I was born number nine. Well, I'm not going to get number nine in Montreal, guys. There was a guy named yeah. the Rocket that wore that number, so I wasn't getting that. So the first year they gave me a number, and I didn't I did I was just happy to be there. They gave me 34. I wore that for the first first while and then after I was kind of I guess they felt that I was kind of solidified maybe not going anywhere they asked me if I wanted to change the number so I went to 27 you know Mahovlich and uh, Sittler both wore it so it was pretty cool to wear that number so it's, that's the reason I ended up with 27. And uh, how's it feel to have a beauty brother-in-law like Darcy Tucker? <laughs> well we we actually live six doors apart so he's just down the uh, six doors apart he's just down the road um, it's great. We, we met each other when I got uh, traded back to Montreal the second time. So uh, we were hanging out a lot together. It was him and I and Murray Barron and uh, Dave Wilkie was there at the time, Dave Manson. We spent a lot of time together uh, when we were in Montreal when I first got back there. And, and then my mom and sister came down to visit and he took a liking to my sister and asked me if you could ask her out. And I said, sure. And she said no the first two times. He said, ah, he's too short. <laughs> <laughs> but the third, I, used to love, I used to love watching him play. The third time to charm, she said. The third time she said yes, and everything's history from there, boys. Yeah, oh, he really? he plays the game the right way. He's um, he he plays hard, plays in, with a uh, with passion and intensity, and that's what I love. I think I think that's why you guys love the players you love. You like guys that play with intensity and passion, and love the game, and they play the game the right way. As far as I'm concerned, and uh, he he de he definitely did that. He was, and he's a lot of fun. We we spend a lot. Like I said, we're six days six doors apart. We 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 spend a lot of time together. I'm going to his house tomorrow night, so. We'll have a few arms for you down there, boys. Yeah. Oh, okay. That sounds good. Yeah. Saturday will be a little rough. Uh, you scrapped Brad May. Uh, yeah. You eventually became good friends with him after the Yeah. So the funny thing is, Mady played in uh, junior in uh, for uh, Bill of Forge, too. Bill of Forge was my coach, uh, my second coach in junior, because our first coach ended up getting fired. And Mady actually wore, uh, I think Mady wore 27 in junior. Uh, I, I, think I, I think it was 27 in junior. Anyways, um, yeah, he came to Buffalo, and we, it was funny. We, were, we knew each other a little bit because of Bill LaForge, and we played junior in the Ontario League and stuff like that. And he comes out in the ice. I remember it like it was yesterday. Earl, I was out there with Scotty Thornton and I think one of the Robert's brothers. Um, and then out comes him. Uh, it might have been – who was the big – uh, Gord was it Gordy Donnelly? Or was it not wasn't Gord Donnelly? It was Brad Brad May? Might have been Gord Donnelly actually. I'm trying to think of the other guy. Robbie Ray was one of them. It was Rob, Rob Ray, Ray? Brad and May. Roberge. We had Roberge in ours. We had the Mario Mario the Roberge brothers on our team for a while. They were beauties. Oh my God, wow boys. <laughs> Anyways, so we're out there. Mady comes and takes the face off. And I'm at, I'm playing center at the time. I'm thinking, what's Mady taking a face off? So I knew in my head. I'm a, I'm a couple years in the league. So I. I'm knowing why these three guys are coming out here because the game was getting out of hand a bit. So I'm already knowing I'm not even going to worry about the puck when the puck gets dropped. And maybe I'll tell you the same story. The puck goes down and I just go, and I just let him have it. He was coming out there. They were coming out to fight us. But as soon as the puck dropped, I let him have the first one. So I got the first one and good. But we, we had a really good, it was a good tilt. It went on forever. And my arms in the, like I was in the penalty box. I couldn't even move. And he's a big, strong, tough guy. And, you said it, Mady and I become friends. I love the way he played it. He was a real good team guy and played hard, and he was probably one of the tougher guys around. But we became yeah. friends uh, since then, and we've done. A, we do a lot. Actually, do a lot of the charities I was talking about earlier. We spent a lot of time together, and they're a lot of fun. 
we go to the hard stroke ones. We do a lot of hockey ups, homeless ones. And we actually go out east a lot together. And it's a lot of fun out east, too. And we've had some good nights together. So, yeah, yeah. it's weird. You fight the guy and then you end up being buddies. But we kind of had a bit of a connection before because we played in the same junior team and had the same coach. We didn't play together. I was, I'm a little bit older than him. But, yeah, he, he's a super guy, man. He, he does a lot of good things for charity back here in Ontario. Yeah, we, we ran into him a few times out here for Hockey Fights Homeless. We went out there to watch the games and have a couple of ums. Yep. I love it. You know, oh, he likes to have his ums, boys. He likes to have yeah. a lot of them. So do yeah, I. So that's why we always end up together at the end of the night on these trips. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Couple yeah. good Canadian kids. Yeah, I was supposed to do Hockey Helps Homeless in Edmonton this year, but all of them got canceled, right? I was supposed to do Edmonton this year, too. I do about I do six or seven of Hockey Helps Homeless. So I was supposed to come to Edmonton. That would have been fun to go back to Edmonton for a couple for a couple pops. Come out to Vancouver. Yeah. Yeah, I, they, they, they actually they talked about me doing the one out there this year, but I, I didn't work from on the date. But if they have it next year, I'll try to get out there for that one for sure. I love Vancouver. Cool. It's beautiful out there, and there's a lot of fun places to go to have a few ums. We'd yeah. like we'd like to crush a pint with you for sure. Oh, dude, I love. I can still crush them pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> You, you remember you remember when you fought Bob Mason, the goalie, in the, the old Pacific Coast? Yeah, Ball yeah, yeah. I, I still feel kind of bad about that one, but not really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember good boys. He, uh, I remember going chasing the puck, and I was going behind the net, and he kind of stuck his elbow. So I kind of – I think I put a bit of an act on when I went down on my back and slid in the corner. And then I said, I'm going to go get that sort of a gun. So I went – I got up, and I went after him, and I remember ripping his mask off and giving him a couple – Remember cutting him uh, on his lip pretty bad, and then everybody came flying down. And I think luckily, luckily for me, they didn't have anybody on the ice. Like Vancouver had some tough guys at that time. I think yeah. Gino was there and a few other guys, but I think they were on the bench. And I, I think Pat – was it Pat Quinn, the coach at that time? I, I believe so. I think it was Pat. And I know Pat, he – I remember going by the bench. He was steaming, steaming. And then Gino wanted to kill me. And I was thinking, thank yeah. God Gino's not on the ice right now. I would have yeah. fought him if I had to, right? But he was one tough son of a gun, man. And, and he could play the game pretty good too, Gino, man. He wasn't a bad player at all. The following uh, yeah, year. Yeah, I remember that. Had... Was, that's an all, a lot of highlights. I remember doing that to him. I remember the, all of them coming down, but nobody dropped their gloves or did any. They jumped, kind of jumped on my back and just tried to pull me off. And I'm thinking in my head, thank God there's nobody real tough out here right now. I got oh, yeah. up pretty easy for beating up the goalie. Where you? We're going to be dropping the YouTube clip into this right here. We'll be watching the video as you can explain that. They, hey, hold literally... on. You know, another thing is, too, remember you were talking about Pepina and the rituals we used to have? You were asking who pumped up who yeah. and all that yeah. stuff? Yeah, yeah. Actually, Claude and I, because I want to tell you a story, because you told me that Claude Pepe was one of your – Claude Lemieux, I call him, we called him Pepe, one of your favorite players, right? So the one year in the playoffs, me and Pepe used to do a lot of this during the season. So we had this thing where – I'd give Pepe the puck and he'd throw it in the open net after warm-up. So back in the day, referees weren't on the ice for warm-up. As soon as you're done your warm-up, the clock goes, you're supposed to go off the ice. So we used to go off the ice and let the team think that, you know, we were done and we'd go back on the ice. I'd pass the puck to Claude and Claude to put in the open net or vice versa. So we're in the playoffs against Philadelphia. We do this the first game. The second game, we go to do it and they've turned the coat, the, the uh, goaltenders turn the net around so we can't score in the open net. We say, oh, forget that. We go down, turn the net back around. We do our little thing. I give Pep the net. He puts me up in that. I think it was the third or fourth game. We go to, we go off, we pretend we're going off the ice. They go off the ice. We think they're gone. We go, we're coming back down the hallway at the forum. And there comes Hospidar and Chico Resch. They were waiting for us coming back on the ice. They come flying out. So we go, we're going to do it anyway. So we come out, they come flying after us. So Peppy's behind me. So I just take the puck and put it in the open net. Those two come flying after me, kind of, barely try to grab me but they don't really grab me and then they go right after Pepe and they grab Pepe so I go over there Chico's trying to grab me Hospital is trying to get and Hospital doesn't play at all neither is Chico me and Pepe at that time were playing a lot of hockey so hospital has got Pepe he's kind of try, giving him like a, a few love taps so I'm kind of there I'm going I don't know what to do I don't know what to do. I remember Don Cherry saying why didn't Shane get in there and tune that guy in but I was worried about getting suspended but what they didn't know is I'm over there and I'm thinking Pepe what do you want me to do you want me to grab? He goes, no, no, stay out. Just stay, stay out. I don't, we don't want to get thrown out because he wasn't even trying to fight back either. we got to stay in the game. So I just stood out. Next thing you know, both teams, guys without gear on, no skates on. We fought. We were That was in the playoffs. It was 45-minute fight. Google it. You'll find it. It's easy to find. It's on YouTube everywhere. It went on forever. There was five or six good fights. because It was hard to see them because the camera was going everywhere. 
The only reason it stopped, and the referees are in their plain clothes watching from over by the penalty box in the old forum. They're watching this, and there's a brawl around the ice. Dave Brown was out there with no, no top on him. Chris Donald had to fight him. So he's trying to hold on to his suspenders around his waist, doing everything he could. It was crazy. And then the only reason that fight stopped is Larry Robinson, remember Big Bird, he just grabbed two guys and just went, enough's enough. And they started yelling at everybody. And then we all kind of went, wow, what are we doing here? Playoff <laughs> game. We just decided. And then all of a sudden, everybody just kind of, then we went off. It was crazy. I remember man. when you, uh, That's a funny story with Pepe. I remember when you pumped uh, Dana Merzen, too. The following got, year, I, after, after you punched the, uh, Bob Mason, the following year you came back and had to fight Dana Merzen, and then you just tooled him. Yeah, that, that one went pretty, good, pretty well for me, boys. He was a big boy. I remember that. But I remember that fight. Like, I don't it, – it's funny. I've had so many fights, and a lot of the guys have. You, don't, you can't remember, especially when you get older. Or you've had a few concussions. You don't remember as many. But I, I actually forgot about the Merzen fight. But it, it turned out pretty good for me. I actually – I remember I caught him with one real good one. I knew that I had hurt him, so I knew that I had him. Because I was – you're always – my dad told me, if you don't – you're not a little bit afraid when you fight. You're, 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 you're not you – you're not playing with a full deck, right? You gotta be careful what you say these days, but I mean, it's just, you, you're not, it's not normal if you're not scared a bit. And I always fought yeah. with a little bit of fear. I mean, I didn't, I didn't mind doing it, but I always fought with a little bit of fear. And I think it helped me, but yeah, I caught him with a good one. And I knew that I, you know, when you've hurt somebody a bit. Yeah. you feel So it. I got him and I, I did pretty good that one. You remember your dummy fights? Yeah. I remember fighting him. Yeah. I, uh, I, I knew Ty, I got to know Ty like way before I ended up, uh, uh, actually playing with him in Toronto, but I knew him when I fought him already. So I remember fighting him. I think I fought him like, how many times I ended up fighting him? Three times maybe I think it was? Yeah, I got yeah one was like, I think uh, not really much of a fight. I think another one, he might've got a bit better than me in the one. And then I think, I think one of them, I got a bit better than him. I, well, it looked good. Anyways, I caught him with a left and he, he went down. So it looked good. I, I could say he might've stepped on a banana peel, but I'll take the win. So I think he yeah. got me the one a little bit more and the other one was more of a tie, but. I have a lot of respect for Ty. I mean, I enjoyed playing against him because he's a competitor too, but I have a lot of respect for him. He's a, he's nuts on the ice, man. He's a, he's not a big guy, but he's, he's thick and just ripped. Yeah. Uh, but he, he, he was one of the toughest and especially for his size. I just got a lot of respect for him in that, that sense. But yeah, it was fun was fighting him for sure. Was um, there a favorite fight of your career? What's that? Was there a favorite fight of your career? Yeah, you know what? There's uh, one I really enjoyed, and I've become good friends with him too. I ended up playing with him in Toronto. Was uh, Owen Nolan? Owen Nolan's a great guy. He's a good, 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 good. He's a beautician. So uh, he's playing for San Jose. He's wearing the C in San Jose, and at that time, I was wearing the C in Montreal because Saku was out for three or four months with a knee injury. So we ended up fighting right at center ice at the Bell Center. Uh, and it was a good tilt. We uh, we went toe to toe, and it, I would have called I'd call that one a draw. We hit each other the same amount of times, and we just the fight was over. We went skating the penalty box. And we, we had a lot of respect for each other. And it was just, it's fun. It was just a good fight. It was fun fighting the other team's captain. And it was right at center ice. So it was pretty cool. But there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of good memories. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, I know fighting, there's a lot of talk about fighting. I mean, I didn't like the fights where the guys just come out and tap each other and say, let's go. The, the, yeah. You know, the pre meditate like the, those fights where you're going to set it up. Like if you fight for a reason for your teammate getting hit or you just got crushed along the board, and you want to get up, stand up for yourself. I mean, I didn't mind those, but I understand with the concussions and everything and the parents and the, their kids and worried with the kids, it's a little bit more understanding. But, I mean, I, I, was, I fought and I, I miss it in the game, to be honest. But, I mean, I understand why they've, they've tried to take it out because they're paying these guys a lot of money and they got to keep them healthy. I mean, talking about fighting, there's not a good one. There was a Philadelphia brawl, and then we had one in Boston. And this one was absolutely crazy fight in Boston. I was in the penalty box. I already got a penalty for crushing anything. I was in the penalty box. And um, Chris Nyland gets into something with somebody and they throw knuckles out for the rest of the period. And back then in the Boston, at the old Boston garden, your benches were almost, were 10 feet apart. And there was nothing in between. You just walk up the ice. So we'd walk up the ice and go down the stairs. There were stairs you had to go down and on cement to go to your dressing room. So knuckles gets uh, thrown out and Terry O'Reilly, we all know Terry O'Reilly's tough as nails and great hockey player. Bro. He's the coach at the time. And he's standing beside, behind the bench. And I'm in the penalty box. So I'm kind of watching knuckles because knuckles goes crazy. I'm thinking, oh, my God, what's going to happen here? So he's going off the ice. And sure enough, I could see O'Reilly chirping Knox a bit. And I'm thinking in my head, that's not a good idea. <laughs> sure enough, Knox just goes, boom, and drifts Tara, Tara Ride, the coach. Sure enough, both, both benches. I'm sitting in the box, penalty box. I go, 
I jumped out of the penalty box. <laughs> We're fighting down the hallway. Then we go down the stairs. There's, there's guys down the stairs fighting. You're scratching their skates in the cement and everything. We brawl down there for 10, 15 minutes. Kind of starts breaking up. So I go, oh, God, I jumped out of the penalty. I could get suspended. So I went and jumped back in the box and sat there. And I, like, I didn't, wasn't doing anything. And they never suspended me. It was Like, that's the back of the day, though, right? So not as many cameras, no video cameras and all this stuff. So nobody really – they didn't catch me. So I sat there and never got suspended. Got to play the rest of the game. It was great. Oh, I miss those days, boys. Oh, well, there's another one in Vancouver, too, eh? Oh, really? We're out in Vancouver. Well, I got two for Van in Vancouver for you, boys. You probably don't know about. But anyways, we're in Vancouver. It's Halloween. But obviously, we don't have any Halloween stuff. So we go to one of the one of the favorite spots in Vancouver. You guys probably know it. The Roxy. Roxy. <laughs> 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 anyways, we're there. Everybody's dressed up, though, because it's Halloween. So there's this one guy dressed up. What's the what's the movie there where the guy he's got the whip and he's like dressed like a cowboy? What's that movie called? Do you remember? No. Anyways, I think it's what's his name? Ford is the, is the Harrison Ford's the actor in it. Tombstone. And what's that? Tombstone. No, it'll come to me. It'll come to me. Anyways, he's dressed up like a cowboy, Harrison Ford in this movie. This guy. So me, Charlie Carbo. Uh, Sergio Amasso and Chris Nyland are all together, like close together, right in, this, in, the, in the place. And this guy comes kind of, comes through, like a little bit maybe, bumps into Knox a bit. And you guys know uh -oh. Knox, he was tough, right? But nobody knows Knox like we do. Like he doesn't take any South Boston guy. Guy bumps into him. And he looks at me and goes, that guy bumps into me one more guy. I'm gonna, one more time, I'm going to give it to him. I go, really? And I'm young, right? I'm like, I think it was my second year in the league. Sure enough, the guy comes through, bumps into Knox a bit. No questions asked, boys, no nothing. Down guy goes. Next thing you know, there's all kinds of guys because it's in Vancouver. This guy's got all kinds of buddies. Next thing, we're on people trying to pull people out. We get back to the hotel, the West, and down by the water there. So because of this, we're late for curfew. We're going, oh, my God. Oh, my God. What are we going to do now? So – we try to sneak in the back way through where there was a food service and all that. We knock over this big, you know, where they put the trays. We knock that thing over, try to pick it up, put it in place. We get up there. Sure enough, I, I'm, I'm room with Bobby Smith at the time, right? Bobby Smith's my roommate. So I think what had happened is uh, the coach had called and Bobby was, you know, he didn't cover. He said, you know what, course is out. So, me and Carbo and Knox got caught uh, out after curfew, and um, Carbo and Knox actually had to sit up the next game, and I actually had to pay a small fine because he goes, that guy's a young guy. And I'm thinking in my head, oh, my God, there are two veterans. I'm a rookie. Please sit me out with them, or they're going to hate me forever. But they did, and they were unbelievable great teammates. They came to me and said, we understand. We're veterans. We should have known better and should have got you home. So we understand why they're taking it easy on you, right? So that's why they did it that way. But that's another good story. And then there's one more in Vancouver. We're playing in Vancouver. And it was Ed Jonoski was playing there in uh, Vancouver. And I, I got a lot of respect for Joel, a great player. Um, did a lot of great things in his career. But he said something. I can't remember what it was. And I went off. Went, I lost my marbles. My eyes went, like, back in, the head, in my head. And I just went crazy. And we tried to get at each other. But everybody was grabbing, grabbing us apart. And then we were kind of trying to, I'll be honest, throw, it's bad. We were trying to even hit each other with our sticks and everything. We were on our way to the penalty box, and then we were still being stupid and everything. So they threw us out. So they, he went to his room down his hallway. I went down. Instead of going to my dress room, though, I went right down the hall, down the back hallway, the rink there in Vancouver, down their hall, and into the dress room. I don't remember a lot of it. I was blacked because I was going so crazy. I ended up in the dress room, standing on her Vancouver Canucks emblem Hello. in Vancouver dress room, yelling at Jovo, trying to fight him in their dress room. He's standing behind. Bertuzzi's in there. Burke was hurt, so he's in there. And I knew the trainer there because I, he was our stick boy in, in junior in Hamilton. So the two of them are standing there saying, of course, of course, settle down. And Joel was behind him. And I'm trying to get a Joel to throw my helmet at him. And, and then all of a sudden, somebody says, of course, of course. And you know when you shake out of it? So I shook out of it. I go, holy jumping. I'm in the Vancouver dressing room here trying to fight Joel. What the heck's going on? I got to get out of here. So I got out of there. I got, I got suspended, I think, for a couple of games for that and a fine. But whatever. It was fun. It's a good story. You I ended up in the Vancouver that. dress room trying to chase down Jobo to fight him in the dress room. Yeah. Wow, not a boy. That's, hear the story. That's impressive. I'll hear it after. That's impressive. Uh, you played 1,156 games. Do you have a favorite game? Favorite game. You know what? 
I'd have to, I'd have to just say my first, like, I don't know. There's so many great memories. There's so many, I just, I just felt, I felt fortunate and lucky that I got to play even one game in the NHL. Never mind 1100. And what is it? 56 or 57? I don't even know myself. Yeah. I mean, so I just feel fortunate and lucky that I got to play one game in the NHL. Um, probably one that I'll remember for a long, long time though is, uh, well, there's two, obviously my first game, uh, the first time I stepped on the forum ice, it wasn't even a game. The first time I st- stepped on the ice in the forum was amazing for training camp. I just felt like, oh, my God, I have a chance now. Like, I have a chance. I'm in one of the greatest arenas in sports history and one of the greatest teams in the world. And I'm, I'm going I'm going to be trying out for their hockey team and have a chance to make it. But the, the, the game, it's funny, the game that I would remember the most, there's two of them. But the one that we have already talked about is the game that I was just sitting there. I just felt like we, were, we sat there. I remember sitting there with Gretz for like 15 minutes after the game was over. People were leaving the stands. It was the game in '98 when we lost the checks in the shootout? Like I'm, we're just sitting there going, "Oh my God, we were this close to winning a gold medal." And we sat there for 15 minutes and didn't say a word to each other. He sat, I sat. We just we didn't say a word, and it was like we just about won a gold medal and we just lost. And then obviously losing in the uh, Stanley Cup final against to, to Calgary in the Forum. We were one of the only teams to lose the Stanley Cup in the Forum, and that's not a good thing to be known for. But it's something I'll never forget. It was the hardest thing that ever happened to me. I was so close to winning the Stanley Cup there that year too. It was just. I'll never forget it. I'll remember, I remember Dougie scoring one of the goals, Gilmore, and then I remember Lanny McDonald scoring. They showed on TV all the time. He scores the goal and he's jumping behind, like kind of running yeah. on a skates behind the net. Yeah. So I have to see that all the time in sports, and that's something I'll never forget. So I'm reminded of it by Lanny every time, which I'm I'm so happy. It was one of my idols growing up that he won a Stanley Cup, but not against me. And then the other one was actually when we were in St. Louis when uh, Iserman scored the double overtime goal in uh, Game Seven against us when I played in St. Louis. He took the slap shot on Robert Casey's shoulder. Yeah. Fear as he was hurt. I got to see that one too. Same thing. Eisman running down the ice like this with his arms up and we're losing, right? So, I mean, it's always those. And then the Canada Cup game when we won 91, the Canada Cup in Hamilton. Yeah. Unbelievable feeling to win that championship with guys like Mark Messi, Wayne Gretzky, you know, Koff, Talk, it was there. Uh, I could just go on and on, but it was just incredible, uh, incredible feeling. It's always the best ones when you win as a team. It's not the injury where you've had a great game yourself for me. I mean, uh, it's not the individual games. It's the games where you've won championships and lost championships are the ones you're going to – the ones that I'm going to remember. I wish I could forget some of them, but they're the ones I'm going to remember the most. Dane, we really appreciate you taking your time today with us, man. Thank um, you so much for coming out. We would love to have you on. We'd love to have you on again if we could. Yeah, yeah, I got uh, – you know what, boys? I love to go on with you guys. It was easy. It was fun. Uh, I appreciate you having me. Keep doing your thing. Enjoy it. Uh, we love – I mean, I love doing this with the real hockey fans, the guys that appreciate the way I play the game, and uh, I appreciate it. And definitely, I'll come on again anytime. You you know how to get, yeah. reach me now, and we'll do it in another month. I got so many more stories, like tons of stories, guys. Like, we, we want to no we idea. We want to hear all the stories, so that's – we'll take it in. Next time we can have a drink together, that would be a lot better. Anyways, I want to give a shout out to the boys from My Only Touch Greatness. They're amazing dudes. They know their game of hockey and they love players that play the game the right way. Keep her going, boys. Great. Thanks, Thanks. Shane. Thanks, Shane Corson. Yeah, no problem, boys. And uh, yeah, stay in touch with me and we'll do another one in a month. I got, I got lots of stories, tons. Okay. Okay. Cheers. Cheers.